Now the main thing that we've learned, or the overarching thing that we've learned in the first two videos is that there is a connection between a distance versus time and a rate versus time graph and we can move back and forth between the two. Uh, that there's a transformation that exists between the two. Now this turns out to be something very uh, important, very fundamental in what we're studying in calculus and it extends much farther than we've gone so far. But just to capture what it is that we're saying, we'd like to introduce a diagram now. And that is when I have d versus t and r versus t graphs, there's a connection between them. Namely, I can go from a d versus t to an r versus t graph by looking at the slope. And I can go from an r versus t graph back to a d versus t graph by looking at the signed area. Well, all of that sounds good, and yet it turns out there's one thing still missing from this diagram. Do you remember in the first video how we talked about the fact that in the d equals rt relationship we had a d versus t graph and yet the r was hidden and it turned out to be hidden in the slope and then in the r versus t graph the d was hidden it was hidden in the area beneath the curve well there's still one more thing that's hidden in this uh, diagram that we have here that connects d versus t and r versus t and we're going to try to tease that out now See if you can guess it before we get there. So to get at what is missing, I've tried to put out here the simplest graph I could think of, simplest paragraphs of D versus T and R versus T. So somebody that goes um, from position 0 to 100 in exactly two hours at a constant slope gives us a constant rate or velocity of 50. And so we invoke the diagram that we used before, namely that we can go from d versus t to r versus t by calculating the slope. Then we can go from r versus t back to d versus t by finding the signed area. Okay. Now here's the problem. Suppose I take a different trip, and in this one, I start here at 30. And I end up, let's say, at 130. So, I'm trying to make that sort of a straight line. Imagine that that's a straight line. Okay, so here's the D versus T curve for a dotted blue trip. Now, what is the corresponding R versus T curve? Well, we find the slope. It definitely is going to be 50 miles per hour. And so the R versus T curve goes right here. Okay, now, can you see what the problem is? The difficulty is, if I want to go back from the R versus T to the D versus T, the signed area is identical in both cases because the rate or velocity is identical in both cases. And so now we have the problem. How do I know if I'm looking at a given R versus T curve, whether the corresponding D versus T curve is this one or this one. Right? I don't know which one came from this R versus T curve. And in fact, it could have been any of a whole family of functions. We could have started here and had a curve like this. Okay, we could have started even farther up. 
and had a curve like this, something like that. Okay. This is, I'm going to just say, this is a family of functions. Okay. So the difficulty is we can always go from D versus T to R versus T without any trouble. But to go from R versus T back to D versus T, there's something that we don't know. Some information has somehow been lost. And what it is, of course, is the initial position. And so we need to amend this diagram. To go from R versus T to D versus T, it's not just signed area, it's signed area plus initial position. And if we add on the initial position, then we know not only the distance that we've traveled, but the distance that we are from home. We've been calling this home, but more abstractly, this is just the origin. Okay. And the distance from the origin, we're going to also give a new name to, to be more precise. You'll remember that the rate we gave a more precise name to, the velocity, and now we're going to do the same thing and we're going to give the distance, we're going to call that the position. x a function of t. That's the more precise way to talk about what we were colloquially calling the distance from home. Well, we've already covered the main point that I wanted to go over in this lecture, namely that we have to be careful and account for the initial position when we're moving from an R versus T to a D versus T graph. But there's one thing else I'm going to throw in which really just prefigures some of the material from the next lecture. And that is, we've been calculating, we've been talking about area under the curve and calculating distances traveled based on the R versus T curve. But in a sense, all we've been doing is multiplying the rate times the time because the areas we've been working with have all been rectangles. Rectangle is just the base times the height. And so, in a sense, maybe it should come as no surprise that um, what we've called the area under the curve really is the distance simply because rate times time is distance. But what about a curve like this? Now we've seen sloped curves for d versus t, but we haven't looked at slope curves for v versus t. Question is, what's the distance traveled when the velocity keeps changing? Well, one way to think about this, and this is not a an airtight proof, but it at least suggests a proof, is that in this particular case, for example, where we end up traveling at 40 miles per hour, uh, but we don't go that fast immediately, and we do this over the course of three hours, one argument that we can use is that, look, for every minute or whatever small interval here at the beginning that I was going close to zero miles an hour, there is an exactly corresponding interval here where I was going close to 40 miles an hour. And if you average those two, you come out at 20 miles an hour for both of the intervals. Well, there's another interval right here where I'm going, whatever, let's say approximately, what is that, maybe three miles an hour. But there's a corresponding interval here where I'm going for that same amount of time at approximately uh, 37 miles an hour. And so again, when you average those two speeds, you find that for both intervals you could say you were going 20 miles per hour. Well, I hope you can see where the argument goes from now on. You could pair up these little intervals all along the way and argue that effectively you've just been going 20 miles an hour for the entire three hours. And so you would cover a distance of 20 times 3, which is 60 miles. 
Now, what about the geometric interpretation? Suppose we simply asked, what is the area under this curve? Well, the area under this curve is the area of a triangle. And what's the area of a triangle? Well, the area under the curve is going to be one half, whatever the base is, times the height. And the base here is three hours. And the height here is 40 miles per hour. Again, we've talked before about how the units for area are unusual. So there's no need to go over that again. But what do we get? We get uh, 3 times 40 is when 20. And half of that is 60. And so we have, in fact, gone 60 miles. So what's the point here? Well, it's simply that this area under the curve concept has a little bit more validity, if you will, because we see that it's not just that it works for rectangles, but for triangles as well. And that's going to turn out to be something we have to think about more in the next lecture, because the question is, what does it mean to have the rate or velocity constantly increasing? So think about that. So let's recap what we've learned. The key insight this, uh, in this lecture has been that there is a diagram that we want to start thinking about that connects the D versus T graphs with the R versus T. Namely, to go from D versus T to R versus T, we calculate the slope. And to go back from R versus T to D versus T, we calculate the signed area under the curve. We learned that there's one additional point, and that is we need to add the initial position in order to accurately represent where we end up as we go from the R versus T to the D versus T curve. And that's why in future diagrams and future lectures, we're going to refer more precisely to uh, D as position, X, a function of T. Finally, the last thing that we learned was simply that this notion of assigned area in an R versus T graph will work for triangular areas just as well as for rectangular ones.